Hello, welcome to A Stitch in Time. Today is Wednesday, January 23rd, 2019, and this is episode 87. My name is Carol, and I am known as Knits and Pearls on Ravelry. The show notes for this and every episode can be found on the blog and also in the episode thread in the Ravelry group. If you'd like to get in touch, I would love to hear from you. You can send me a private message on Ravelry, leave a comment on YouTube, or leave a comment in the group, and I will do my best to get back to you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me today on this beautiful sunny day here in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia, Canada. I live about 60 miles or 100 kilometers east of Vancouver and after the cold wet rainy day we had yesterday I have to say it was a welcome sight to see sunshine this morning. I would like to take this moment to welcome any of you who are new viewers who are checking me out for the first time. I hope you like what you see and that you'll be back. And thank you also to the returning viewers, some of you who have uh, stuck with me for over two years now. Thanks so much for coming back and uh, thanks also to all of you who reached out to me this past week. I always enjoy hearing from you and um, there are several people who I have ongoing conversations with on um, private message on Ravelry and I really enjoy that uh, back and forth with all of you. So um, Oh, I was going to say, did you see the uh, moon the other night, the full moon? Wasn't it absolutely gorgeous? We saw it at about 7 p.m., which was about two hours earlier than it, the peak viewing time here where I live. But even so, it was just, uh, just stunning. Um, I have lots of knitting to talk about this week. In fact, this week's lineup... It reads pretty much like last week's knitting lineup. Um, it's all the same projects, but I have made uh, some progress on each one of them, so I decided it was worth showing them all to you again. Um, before we get into it, first I'm going to take a quick sip of tea, and I will show you the show off the third and final mug that I received over the Christmas holidays. So this is from my daughter Jessica. And it came with a little wooden tray and a teaspoon and a little tea infuser shaped like a teapot. And I don't know if you can read that. It says starry skies, cozy nights, hot tea, frosty mornings. I just love the images those words uh, conjure up. Before we get into the knitting, there are a couple of things I wanted to talk about first. Um, the first one is the New To You Craft Along that is currently taking place over in the Ravelry group. Um, I decided that this was the year I was going to try sticking for the first time. And I thought there might be some others out there who are also trying either new techniques within uh, their craft or new crafts altogether, and I thought it would be nice to have a place to chit chat about those, um, show our progress, cheer each other on, offer some sage advice if we happen to have it, and um, so I've got the the this craft along running from January first to February twenty eighth, and it's not an fo cal, it is just a chatter thread that's open. And when it is over, I will draw one or two or more names from it and award some prizes. I'm sorry, I still have not nailed down exactly what those prizes are going to be. But as soon as I do, I will let you know. I've also been uh, sort of muddling something over about that cowl this week. And uh, when I first announced it, I had expressed that I wanted the projects in it to have been started on or after January 1st of this year. And the more I've thought about it, the more I've decided um, that that's maybe not really even relevant. Um, it's not an F.O. Cal, so it's not as though everyone that not as though that levels the playing field for everyone to have the same amount of time to begin and end a project. Um, I was thinking that what I would what I would like to do is is say that it's open to projects that were begun prior to January first, 
but the new to you part needs to have taken place in the new year. For example, perhaps you cast on a pair of socks in December, but you're trying out a new heel and you didn't either, you haven't got to it yet or you didn't get to that part of it until the new year. Jump on in, tell us about it, show it to us. Um, maybe you cast on a colorwork hat, you did the ribbing in December, but you didn't actually uh, start the color work until January. I'm going to say those kinds of projects count because it's all about being new to you and it's less about the uh, number of projects you do or the uh, uh, it's less about finishing them and it's more about sharing our experiences and having uh, bringing ourselves out of our comfort zone and trying something new for the first time. So that could be a new technique or it could be a completely new craft. So maybe you have um, uh, never tried um, quilting, but you, so you want to try that. Or maybe, maybe you have uh, quilted but never sewn a garment and you want to try and sew a garment. It's, it's pretty loosey-goosey. I don't want tons of rules. I mostly, what I really want to see is people uh, sharing their experiences and, uh, and um, cheering each other on. So come by, check it out in the Ravelry group. I would love to uh, see you there. Another thing I wanted to talk about before we jump into the knitting is the conversation that's been going on in our knitting community this past week. Uh, if you've been on social media or you've been watching podcasts, chances are you know what I'm referring to. If you do not, um, there was a blog post written by a woman last week that has sparked a conversation in the knitting community about racism and inclusion. I am not on Instagram, which I understand a lot of the discussion initially took place there. Uh, and so I wasn't aware of anything until I was watching a podcast on Sunday afternoon and um, the podcaster made reference to this conversation and also to a conversation thread that was going on in Ravelry. And so I um, put down the knitting and turned off the podcast and went on to Ravelry and started to read. So this conversation thread included a link to the original blog post and the person's follow-up post and also links to Instagram responses, which I did not access since I don't have an Instagram account. But I did read the Ravelry thread. Um, normally, if you've been watching, you know this podcast is pretty much about the knitting and the crafting and the reading and you get some insight into uh, my daily life. Um, and I really made a conscious decision to stay away from controversial topics because I don't feel like that's why people come here. Um, on the other hand, um, I felt as though I couldn't pretend I hadn't seen this and that I didn't know what was going on and I felt that, um, that the subject deserved uh, at least an acknowledgement. Um, our knitting community does not exist in a bubble. It is part of the greater world. And um, sadly, racism is a part of that greater world. I confess that racism is not something I've given a lot of thought to until now. And I'm sure that that is in large part because it's not something I have personally um, experienced in the way that so many other people have. Um, and I, while I acknowledge that this can be um, a difficult subject and um, can give rise to a lot of emotion, I do think it's important to uh, read and listen and learn. And um, especially at a time when our world is getting smaller and smaller and we are encountering people from all corners of the globe like we never did before. Uh, this topic can, is, can be, has been discussed much more eloquently than I ever could 
And so if you're interested, I would refer you to the Ravelry thread that I referenced. And also I watched an episode of Christy Glass Knits yesterday. And she had a panel of people on discussing this topic. And so if you're interested, I would encourage you to watch that too. So I'm going to provide um, links to both those in the show notes. And um, let's get on to the knitting. I would say that the project that's received the most attention this week is my Through Stone Cardigan by Bristol Ivy. Here's a look at the colorwork yoke on that. The yarn that's being used is um, Cloudborn, I had to look at the label, Cloudborn Highland Sport. And this is a yarn by Craftsy. And there's four colors. There's the main color, which is this, it's called Shayla Heather. There's a lighter beige, which is um, Taupe Heather. There's a darker beige, which is Stone. And then there's a teal, which is called Ocean. And this was part of a kit that I bought from Craftsy. So um, as I mentioned last week, I decided to knit the sleeves first because um, both the sleeves and the body need to be done before you can do the color work yoke. So I thought, well, let's get what I consider the most boring part over with first. So I cast on my two sleeves and, and I think last week I got about to here. So you can see I've put some length on those and probably a little over halfway up the sleeve now. So, um, not very exciting, I confess. And um, despite my best intentions, I couldn't resist delving into the color work <laughs> before the sleeves were done. So the cardigan has um, pockets and it has, they have a color work lining to them. I'm just gonna see if I can find the photo easily. I didn't think to prep it before I recorded. Hmm, it's going to be on the last page, you know that, right? There we go. So you can see the color work just peeks out the top of the pocket. And so um, I decided to give that a go. My hunch is even though the color work is mostly hidden, I think the pocket is maybe put on, maybe the pockets are put on as a way to A, get a sense of the color work and B, get some practice sticking before you stick down the front of the whole cardigan. Uh, and the pattern is written in such a way that you cast on the stitches for one pocket lining, you join them in the round, and then you knit your pocket lining, and then you stick it. And so I, I cast on, I think it was 36 stitches, and I got this far, and I thought there has to be a better way. Um, there are a lot of ends to deal with. The, I didn't feel like I had room to stretch out my stitches on the needle to, to um, help my stitching uh, to keep it even. Because when I do color work, I like to have a lot of room to stretch my stitches out and that helps keep the, fo the floats loose. So I got that far and I thought, no, I can't do this. So I took them off, took it off the needles and I sort of thought, why couldn't I knit both pockets at the same time? Since I need to anyway, why not knit um, two? And then I could have more room to spread out my stitches. And um, so that's what I did. I, I cast on more or less twice the number of stitches and set up sticking at each end and proceeded to knit my um, pockets like that. And then I took the steps I needed to steak. So I've actually put together a series of video clips uh, from the other day as I was going through this process. So I'm going to put that in here. So here's my second attempt at the pocket lining. 
or pocket linings to be more accurate because this time around I did them both at the same time. Uh, just, a, just a word of note, I am holding the camera in one hand while I manipulate the knitting with the other so there might be a little bit of wobble. I just couldn't find a way to set up the camera to be hands free. In any case, um, I cast on 74 stitches onto a 32 inch or 80 centimeter long circular needle and I joined for working in the round. Each half consists of 37 stitches which is 31 stitches for the pocket chart, pocket lining chart, plus I put three steak stitches on either side. So you can see one, two, three. The same is true for each side, and then if you flip it around, the same is true for there. And so the pattern has you begin the color work chart right away, but I instead worked one round of plain knitting in the main color. There were a few reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is I found it very fiddly trying to work the color work onto the cast on row. Um, I also thought the row of plain color would give a good base to begin the color work on or to base the color work on. Um, I didn't think one extra row would make much difference in the overall size of the pocket and plus the pocket lining is going to be inside the sweater so it's never going to show. So I'm pleased with that decision. It was much easier to work than trying to do color work on the very first round. And so I did that and then I just proceeded to to follow the chart and then the last step is to bind off your steak stitches and slip the rest of the pocket lining stitches onto waste yarn to be worked into the sweater later. Now um, I have to say I believe the tension is much smoother than it would have been um, from then when I was working it on a uh, smaller circumference and it will um, even out even more after I block it. At least that's what I've learned from experience. Um, one of the problems that I was afraid of on the working with the smaller circumference is that here where you change needles you can often end up with some unevenness. I find this when I knit socks all the time that that center stitch or that joining stitch whatever you want to call it the first stitch of the next round or the next half of round often is a little bit misshapen. It's not so much a visible on this um, first attempt but it's definitely visible on this second attempt. You can see there are two stitches of beige there in the middle that appear bigger and looser than the ones beside it and I think that's just from having poor tension as I've made the transition from one needle to another. So I'm very glad that that will not be appearing in the center of my pocket lining. Even though it would be hidden inside the sweater, I still would be unhappy with that. So in this case, I'm going to end up crocheting um, stitches along, uh, two rows of crocheted stitches along uh, these steak stitches. And this is where I'm going to cut my steak on either side. And so those bigger stitches will basically be gone forever. <laughs> they will not factor into the end product, I guess is the best way to put it. And so that is what I'm going to go do now is crochet my steak edges and then cut my knitting. I'm not really sure if I'm supposed to be blocking this before steaking or not. I'm choosing to do it after. So hopefully that turns out to be the right decision. So anyway, yeah, there I do feel much happier with my second go-round than my first go-round. I found this extremely fiddly to work and just wasn't happy with anything about it. <laughs> so um, there, there's a tip for you if you are working the same pattern or um, need to do something similar. Might as well kill two birds with one stone.
Okay, so it's now a while later and I have completed crocheting my steak stitches according to the video tutorial by Very Pink Knits that was recommended to me by Lisa or Fiber Nymph. So, um, normally I would only have had five steak stitches and these two lines of crochet would have met up. They would not have had this half a stitch from the front and half a stitch from the back uh, left over. So if you can see this bar here, that's what I'm going to cut along. And basically I'll be cutting this stitch out of the middle. Now this side looks quite tidy. Uh, my other side is not quite as tidy. I This is the first side I did and I had some challenges and had to take it out a few times and ended up breaking a stitch and just overall it's just not as tidy but I think once it's done it will be fine. Um, this is also where the front and the back meet the beginning and end of round and I think that added an extra challenge because I had some ends from the other side that were getting um, snagged into the steak stitches. But um, wish me luck I'm going to go Cut my steaks now. Okay, I did it. I cut my very first steak. The side looks pretty good, although there's a little bit of a loop there. I think that's okay. This side, um, I think I mentioned I had broken a stitch. You can see uh, back here there's an end, so I'll make sure that that gets woven in really well. And I'm not quite sure about this loop here. I guess that might be the other end of that broken stitch. So I'll make sure it gets um, woven in so that it doesn't come unraveled. So not perfect this side, but I think it's serviceable. I also accidentally snipped off all but a very short end of my crochet chain. But what I'm going to do is just make sure when I stitch the uh, pocket lining into the... Um, to the sweater that this um, corner is caught really well and that that, that end does not come unraveled. Um, so yeah, I'm off to do the second steak. So you can see I have two pocket linings there. I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is the second cut on this pocket lining went extremely well. You can see it looks very tidy and if you flip it over it gives you a look at the edge. So this turned out really well. The uh, bad news is that I unfortunately for about three quarters of an inch at the beginning of the stick snipped the wrong part of the stitches and snipped away part of the crochet chain. Uh, let's see if I can show it to you here. And so unfortunately I have some stitches that are escaping. What I think I will do is attempt to just um, uh, catch those stitches either by machine or with a, a needle and th or a yarn and thread or yarn and needle I should say and I'll see how it works out. I know there are some people who never finish their steaks at all because the yarn will eventually felt together. I'm not I'm sure if I'm that brave. So what I think I'll do is attempt to mend this and then I'm going to soak and block these pieces. And worst case scenario is I do them over again and that wouldn't be such a bad thing to have um, more practice. I'll also get a sense once they're blocked if my gauge is right. I have a feeling it might be a little bit too loose in which case they should be done over anyway with a smaller needle and then that gives me another chance to practice this. So all is not lost. Uh, practice, well, I don't think it makes perfect, but it certainly is not a bad thing to have. Okay, so there you're getting a look at the pocket linings pinned out on the uh, blocking board. They are um, sideways to you. Here's the top and then the top on this one. Um, I took the machine and stitched a little bit along the edge where I had this um, loose, loose uh, 
yarn. And I also machine stitched along this edge where I cut the steak by mistake. <laughs> um, actually, the stitches disappear quite nicely once the uh, yarn was soaked. Um, it bloomed quite a bit. Uh, my initial look at things, uh, the gauge widthwise seems to be uh, quite good. Yeah, so that's a good thing to know. Um, I've been using a three and a half millimeter needle for it for the color work, which is a half a millimeter bigger than I've been using for the stockinette portion or plain stockinette um, without color work. Um, I do have less rows per inch lengthwise, which means I guess that the pocket is longer, about an inch longer than it's supposed to be but I can take that into account when positioning it on the sweater. I'm planning to make the body longer anyway because I have a long torso and tend to like my sweaters a little bit longer. So that shouldn't be a problem. I'll just have to keep that in mind. I'm anxious to see this once it's dried and, and see how the steaks hold up. I'm Because of this error on this part, I am leaning towards um, redoing the pockets. It just doesn't seem to be, if this is the edge of the pocket where it uh, meets the sweater, there's just not very much to hold it there and I'm kind of concerned about that. But it's been a um, good lesson for me to um, experiment with the, doing the color work and also um, learning how to steak and so I'm anxious to redo it and get it right the next time. Okay, so not quite um, the happiest ending to my adventure. Um, here are my my pocket linings. They are all dry now and um, one thing I was one thing I've discovered is that as they dry they have um, uh, squished up a little bit so my row gauge is not off quite as much as I thought it. This is probably about a quarter or I mean about a half inch longer than it should be but I've also got that extra row on the bottom so they'll be fine um, and this is where that mistake happened where I cut this crochet chain so I just don't feel like I can use that and so I have cast on my um, third time, third set of pocket linings. Um, but I think I'll take the lessons I learned with these ones and uh, bring them to the next next step. And I'm confident that that uh, that my new pockets will be even better than my old ones. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, uh, I forgot to do this last week, is that the pattern recommends a lot of extra ease, but I prefer a closer fitting uh, sweater and so I am knitting the 38 and a half inch size, which is closest to my bust measurement, and um, compared to the um, um, Hero that I knit last year which has a similar um, rounded yoke like that it's a little gonna turn out a little bit bigger than my hero and I also plan to add some waist shaping so um, I am not sure how that's going to work with the pockets and the placement because usually I put my front shaping 25% in from each side seam uh, and that might interfere with the pocket placement. So I'm going to have to give all that a little bit more thought, but um, I will definitely want to add some, at the very least, on the back, just to nip that, the cardigan in just a little bit at the waist. Particularly since I don't have a, much of a defined waist, it really helps to give me a little bit more shape when I add waist shaping to a sweater. Speaking of sweaters, I did some more work on my So Faded this uh, week too. And I am knitting this out of, uh, just looking at my notes, <laughs> um, Hedgehog Fibers Sock. And the colors are Vengeance, the next color is Truffle, and the bottom color is Malice. So 
I think when you saw it last, I had just the two colors going, and I have since introduced the third color. And I'm not sure how it's going to look on screen. I think you can see the color variation fairly well there. Uh, this is a dark skein. Oops, a little fluff there. It is a dark skein, but it does have, that's yeah, a pretty good look there, even if it's a little bit blown out maybe. It has like burgundy and blue and kind of um, a lighter pink and black. And so there, it's definitely very tonal, even though at first glance it just looks really dark. So it does pick up some of the colors in the second uh color. Um, I am once again working from each end of the ball and that's helping to break up the color repeats. Um, I haven't taken, a, I haven't worked on this since last week sometime and I haven't taken a really good look at how the colors are distributing in this first inch or so where it's been knit all by itself. And so I'm going to do that. I may end up ripping that first little bit back and re-knitting it with a little bit more of mixing the colors, a little bit more color management, but um, I'll see. When I'm ready to concentrate on that again, I will have a better idea of how how that's going. So anyway, um, still very happy with it. I think it will look nice with that darker color at the bottom. Um, but yeah, just sort of lost, lost focus on this as other projects took, um, took precedence, I guess, in my interest. One of those projects has been my Cedarburg shawl by Tabitha Hedrick. There's a look at it there. Uh, this had been a mystery knit along for Sweet Georgia Yarns, I think a couple of, no, I guess just over a year ago, year and a half ago. And so um, I had th these three colors using together. So color A is Sweet Georgia Tough Love Sock in Gold Mine. This is the same yarn in Smitten. And then this is Impulse of Delight Summit Sock in Dark Amethyst. I had originally um, begun to knit the shawl but had substituted a bright pink for this purple. And by the time I got near the end, I wasn't happy with that color combination and ended up taking it all out and starting over again. So I'm quite excited because I've reached that end section again where there's larger portions of the contrasting color. This is where I am now. I'm on the, I've done two of these narrow lace stripes and I'm working my way towards the third and I have to confess I'm having second thoughts again but I am not taking it out. Um, I'll give you a little look at the whole thing. And there's the purple. Now I have to say on camera and in this light, I am liking it more than I like it in person. <laughs> and I think what I am not liking in person is that the gold is very dominant in these stripes where the two colors are striped with two rows of one color, two rows with another. And I feel like I might be happier with it if this uh, variegated stood alone more next to the wide bands of purple. But holding it from back here, and in this light, I have to say that actually that variegated does come through more than I've realized while I'm knitting it. And when I look at it like this, I'm actually not minding it. So um, I will persevere. I, I just there's no way I'm ripping this out again. Um, but that's reassuring, just to see it from sort of a distance and with a fresh eye, um, I, I think it'll actually be just fine. 
So anyway, I, as you can see, I got a fair bit done on that too. It would be nice to get this one off the needles because I originally started it over a year ago and then my second version I started I think back in September. So that's been on the needles just a little little too long for my liking. Um, I have continued with my plain vanilla socks in uh, turtle pearl yarns, striped turtle toes. And that's in the um, City Girl colorway. I really like this yarn. I've knit with this this um, yarn before. It has a really nice feel. So um, here's as far as I've gotten. Last night I uh, did the heels. I put in Afterthought heels because um, I thought I might have maybe some gold yarn I could insert for the heels that would pick this color up and I didn't. And then I did have I think it was this color. I had some yarn in a similar color, but I didn't have enough. And so I decided the best thing would be to do an afterthought heel so that I could carry on the striping uninterrupted down the uh, front of the foot. And so I just did a little bit. I got as far as the gold stripe, basically divided it in half. Knit um, a few rows of this color and then I inserted the um, heel and I just took the yarn from the other end of the ball so you can see I ended up with just a little stripe of this pink here then the gold and then finished in this color and that's actually the color that's adjacent to it so I'm actually quite pleased with how the coloring worked out I thought maybe it might have been better if it went in reverse, but then that would mean that this color would have ended up next to this color on the foot. So it's probably just as well that it didn't. Um, so anyway, I have um, curling tomorrow night and my husband curls early, so we'll be staying to watch him. And so that'll give me something to work on at the curling rink. Plus, um, I need some carnitting for this weekend. I'll tell you a little bit more about that after. So I wanted to make sure these were um, ready to go for, for that. So um, I made a point of doing that yesterday. Just putting them down. <laughs> so much stuff, I tell you. Um, and then I have worked a little bit more on my um, hazelnut socks. It's in this yarn which is from Magpie, and it is Swanky Sock in the Hell's Bells colorway. I cannot tell you how much I love this yarn. You know, okay, it does. I was going to say it feels like it has cashmere, and it does. It's a 80-10-10, it's a 80 merino, 10 cashmere, 10 nylon, and you can just feel it. It's a really, really nice yarn to work with. And I'm very, very satisfied, very happy with how it's working up. So I've completed the leg and I just um, did the heel and the first, I don't know, 10 or 12 rounds of, oh, I guess 14, because I've done one pattern repeat. So I've done 14 rounds after the heel, working on the gusset. So very, very, very pleased with these. Love these, how they're turning out. Did I tell you it was by Helen Stewart? Hazelnut Socks by Helen Stewart, and it's part of the Handmade Sock Society collection, as is my next sock, which is the Red Robin Sock, and I am knitting that from Knit Picks Stroll Fingering in the Dove Heather colorway, and also from Cascade Heritage 5607, which is red. And this features a textured slip stitch pattern well, not slip stitch, it's yarn overs actually. And I love the contrasting heel. I'm not sure if I've ever done a contrasting um, slip stitch heel flap and gusset. I have often done a contrasting your complementary heel in a short row heel or an afterthought heel, but I'm not positive if I've ever done it with this kind of heel. Anyway, I just really, really love how these are coming 
out way more than I thought. When I got the pattern in the first place, I thought, okay, it's nice, but it didn't, um, you know, set off this, oh, I really, really need to, to knit those right away, where the more I work on these, the more I love them. Sometimes simplicity is just the way to go, I guess. So, yeah, I'm very simple pattern to work on, so it's a good one at the end of the day, and I don't have a lot of brain space, but uh, love, love, love how those are going. And I think I mentioned I've done some reading this week. Um, I went back to my Agatha Christie collection. I have neglected it for a little while, and I just, I wanted to just, I think it was I think I pulled it out just before bed, and I needed something that I didn't have to take a long time to get into. And so I took the next one on the bookshelf, which happened to be the last book on the first shelf. So I have now worked my way through one shelf of my Agatha Christie collection, and I have about two and a half, or no, one and a half to go, I think. Anyway, Sad Cypress. And when I finished it, I thought, I have no idea what that title even refers to. But when I looked it up on Wikipedia today, it actually said the title is drawn from a song in Shakespeare's play, Twelfth Night. And I do not really know Twelfth Night at all. And so perhaps there are elements of this story that um, have some connection to this uh, book. But, uh, but I, sorry, did I say that right? Perhaps there are elements of Twelfth Night that have some corresponding elements to the story. I, I really don't know what they are. I could not speak to that. But um, this book uh, was about a, um, an old woman who passed away and her, her niece uh, inherited um, her estate. Um, and shortly after, uh, a young woman was killed and um, the uh, suspicion fell to the niece who had inherited all of her aunt's uh, belongings, including her home. So um, Hercule Poirot makes an appearance and attempts to, um, attempts to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Prove her innocent, I guess this is what I'm trying to say. Now, so I'm reading this the other night, and I'm like, this close to the end. And um, a lot of my Agatha Christie books I get from uh, used bookstores or book sales or things like that. So there was a page at the back that was loose, which I knew. What I didn't realize is that there are some pages missing between here and the last page of the book. So what's missing is from 214 up to 223. <laughs> so 215 and 222 is actually what's missing. Now, thankfully, or at least as far as I can tell, we've discovered who the true murderer was. But, and I feel like just from the last two pages, I kind of get a gist of how the book ends and what might have taken place between the missing pages, but what a bummer. Um, I went online to see if maybe it was really inexpensive from Kindle, but it, it was like 10 bucks and I'm not paying 10 bucks to find out. So what I will do is keep an eye out for this in the used bookstore, have some credit there anyway, and I'll see if I can get my hands on another copy of this and just read, read the rest. Um, you know, I've had, I have all the Agatha Christie's published and I feel like I've read them all at one time or another over the years because I've gradually collected them over the years. And this one I don't remember at all. So whether I read it and completely forget the storyline or whether I just never read it, I'm not sure. Uh, I've moved on to One Two Buckle My Shoe. It's another Hercule Poirot story. It's, it's also published as An Overdose of Death and the Patriotic Murders. I have just begun um, Hercule Poirot's dentist has been killed the same uh, day that 
he had been in for an appointment. So that's what's happening there. That's the beginning of it. Okay, so that brings us to what's been going on around here this week. Well, too many things to mention, so I won't. It's been quite a full week, so I'll just uh, talk about a few things. First off, uh, Friday night, we went to the Vancouver Canucks hockey game. Uh, Cameron and I were hosting uh, some customers for dinner and the game, and uh, it was a really fun evening. It was a very entertaining game, and the Canucks won, so that's always a bonus. And um, it was with, with two couples that we both actually know have known for a long time and know fairly well. So that really made for a nice evening. Uh, sometimes when I take part in some of these work events, I, I either don't know the customers at all or don't know them very well. So that can be a little more awkward, but in this case, it was very comfortable, very fun. Had a really nice evening. Uh, the next day was the service for uh, Ray's mom. That's my son's girlfriend's mom who passed away on New Year's and um, uh, Ray spoke at the service. I thought she did a, a terrific job. I, I admire her courage. I think it's not only difficult to speak in front of so many people but to speak on a speak about something so personal when your emotions are close to the surface but she did a, a wonderful job and um, one thing, I didn't know her mom, so I, I didn't have um, the same emotions I might have at a funeral for someone I knew. But what sort of brought tears to my eyes were seeing pictures of Ray with her mom and seeing Ray as a baby and a little girl and a teenager because we've only known her as an adult. And so surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, that's what uh, touched my heart the most. Um, Monday night I got together with my lady friends. Um, this is a group of friends. If you've been watching you know we've gotten together now for 16 and a half years, once a month. Um, uh, it started out with people that I worked with and we all invited someone and over the years uh, People have come and gone, but the core group has remained. And um, it was really funny coincidence. I was at the dentist last Wednesday, and um, through a conversation with the dental hygienist, who I've had a few times before, um, she we were talking about Christmas, and she mentioned um, her in-laws, that they had moved back to town after being in um, Mexico for 14 years. And I asked her who her mother-in-law was and it turned out to, which I sort of had a feeling, it turned out to be a woman that I had worked with um, years and years ago and she's the one who started this ladies night group going. So now that she's back in town, hoping we can uh, touch base and maybe she'll even come back and be part of our group again. So um, yeah, that was just one of those small world, small world things. Um, on Friday, we are heading up to my mom's for the weekend. It is her birthday next week and we always try and get up there around her birthday for, um, to celebrate. So another, my oldest sister and her husband are also going. So we'll spend the weekend together. We're Plan to eat out both Friday night and Saturday night, so it should be fun. Um, Cameron's hoping to get away by Friday afternoon. There is a chance we won't be able to go up until Friday evening, but um, in which case we'll miss dinner out with them, but uh, we'll have the weekend anyway. And they've had a really mild winter, so my mom said there's no snow or anything. It's cold though, so we'll make sure we dress for that, but... Um, which weather shouldn't be a concern for travel, so that's good. So yeah, I have my um, City Girl socks I'll be able to work on in the car. And that brings me to something good. And uh, my something good for this week is eagles. Um, this time of year there have been quite a few eagles around and the last few days has been really good for spotting eagles and yesterday 
I caught a glimpse of one quite close to the house roosting in a tree and it stayed there all afternoon. I, at about quarter to five, uh, I was sitting on the couch and something caught my eye and I saw it flying away. Um, and it had been there over four hours. From the, for, from the time I first saw it, it was probably about four and a half hours. And it could have been there for a while before that without me seeing it. And then this morning there was another one in that same tree. Um, but it didn't stay as long. So I actually uh, recorded some video yesterday and today uh, with the eagles in it. So I'm going to put that in um, right now after I say goodbye for your enjoyment. So once again, thank you for watching. I hope you have yourselves a great week and I will see you next week. Bye, happy knitting. I was so excited to look out the window and see this uh, eagle sitting in the uh, neighbor's tree two yards over. Uh, it is a bald eagle. It is an immature eagle. You can tell because it doesn't have the white head or tail feathers yet. Uh, we've seen quite a few eagles around lately. If you're watching Vlogmas, you would have seen uh, several days um, footage of eagles in what I call the eagle tree. In fact, there were five there this morning. There are none there now. Um, maybe this is one that's flown over from there. Um, we used to have a line of trees that ran behind our yard and we would sometimes see eagles in there, but they took those trees down about three years ago. So to see one uh, this close up is kind of a treat, <laughs> unexpected pleasure. So maybe this has become the place to hang out. It is the next morning, and as you can see, I have another visitor here. This time it's a mature bald eagle. So who knows, maybe we'll see a, a few there and then I'll see if I can scroll over to the eagle tree. And you can see there is one eagle in there this morning. As I said, there were five there yesterday morning. Oh, there's a flock of starlings. You can see it's a lovely day today. A little bit of cloud cover on the mountains, but there's some blue sky after yesterday's pouring rain, so I think it's going to be a good day. Shortly after I recorded that, the eagle went and joined its friend in the eagle tree, and it's been uh, sitting there ever since. As you can see, clouds have dissipated, sun's out, there's beautiful fresh snow on the mountains. Apparently this is the place to hang out today. Here we go. All of a sudden there are four where there were two. <laughs>